distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't want to keep you between this outstanding panel, but give you some, some of my thoughts uh, on this topic um, to kind of set the scene for what will be a very excellent panel for you. Um, dissolving lines, of course, between state and non-state actors have altered the character of conflicts where the lines delineating licit and illicit have largely disappeared, deepening the local population's vulnerability to abuse. As a result, asymmetric warfare has become a serious challenge to the state and the military in the contemporary world. Militaries fail to predict conflicts because studies based on previous experiences are inadequate to develop definitions of future man manifestations of conflict and warfare. The future conflicts are unlikely to be a linear extrapolation of past conflicts, and a straightforward extension not only limits our thinking and preparation, but also leaves us vulnerable to future warfighting techniques. Hence, advanced technologies driving changes in conflating new military domains are becoming increasingly relevant to conventional military strategies and emerging manifestation of contemporary warfare. The defense economy has evolved and globalization of the defense industry remains the dominant economic factor driving greater synergies. Increasing tolerance of the export control regime not only permits exports, but also co-development and co-production with partner nations willing to engage and mutually benefit in areas of critical and emerging technologies. Countries with a vibrant ecosystem along with human talent will emerge as front runners by adapting to revolutionary breakthroughs in new technologies. And there are several. As an example, a single crude controlling multiple autonomous platforms containing high performance computing with ubiquitous sensor extension and sustained air combat power, independent of runways and forward logistics footprints will provide air dominance in contested environment. Air superiority in low intensity conflict will provide an edge to uncrewed platforms autonomously operating from permissive to denied environment controlled either by state or non-state actors. Adaptive airborne enterprise interface will shrink traditional RPAs crew deployed footprint and provide operators with the flexibility and mobility to fly multiple platforms from non-traditional locations. Military applications of the three A's, if you will, AI, automation, and autonomous systems include air, domain, air domain persistence via semi-autonomous long endurance airborne systems coupled with narrow AI optimization algorithms. To run them will not only increase the reach of the weapon platforms and undermine capability of potential adversary, but also alter the nature and scope of warfare. I, I will leave you with a couple of thoughts in terms of two categories which I think are uh, important to note. One is the non-state actors. In other words, criminals who operate on a military scale. I think for that, some of the issues to be addressed is persistent surveillance, robust data sharing between countries, constant training cooperation between countries, in particular special forces skills, and finally, military police force collaboration, you know, without breaking constitutional bounds. The other category I will leave a thought with you is on asymmetric warfare against rogue states. Here again, persistent ISR is a strong deterrent. Electromagnetic spectrum dominance will be critical. Ability to correlate petabytes of avail available sensor data into a real-time operational picture, again, will be critical. Ability to deliver mass in numbers, especially loitering munitions, I think will also be critical in asymmetric warfare. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity and look forward to a great panel. Thank you, Vivek, for setting the scene for the conversation that is to follow. Let me now invite uh, the, the panelists on stage, uh, Minister of Defense Netherlands, uh, uh, Minister Ollengren, 
General Anil Chauhan, Andrew Shearer, Sujan Chinoy, Jena Ben Yehuda, and Lisa Singh. Lisa Singh, you have 50 minutes, and they are all yours. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, thank you to Samir, and thank you to the ORF and to the Ministry of External Affairs for hosting such uh, a impactful, dynamic, and meaningful Rizina Dialogue for 2024. It's an honor to be moderating this panel. Uh, this panel, of course, on the Rizina session titled The New Wars, Policies, Practices, and Preparation. I think it's incredibly timely with the current global climate so I'm very excited that we have the opportunity today to better our understanding of the transition from traditional to modern warfare and the implications of these challenges in conflict dynamics. And to do that, I am joined by leaders in the defence and security sector from India, from the Netherlands, from Australia and the United States, who I will be asking to really dive into the themes of this new emerging era of warfare. I'm then going to allow about 10 minutes or so at the end for questions from the floor, and that will give an opportunity for you to think about that during the next 50 minutes. Over the past number of years, the international security environment has become much more complicated. And in that evolving landscape of warfare, this means very much that traditional mechanisms are yielding to unconventional methods and tactics, as we just heard from Vivek. The world has borne witness to a disruptive dis diversification between traditional warfare strategies and a new era of digitised weaponry operating in the shadows and around the clock. Cyber threats, supply chain disruptions, and the proliferation of lethal semi-autonomous weapons by both state and non-state actors are just some of the many emerging themes of modern warfare. Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine and the recent threat of the Houthi group in the Red Sea pose important questions on the use of informal warfare and the threats to national security. But these shared challenges allow us to really open and continue conversations on how nations of shared interests can come together to address these issues. So to do just that, I would like to introduce our panel, India's Chief of Defence Staff, General Anir Shohan, Netherlands Minister for Defence, Kaja Olongren, Andrew Shearer, Director General of National Intelligence in Australia, Sujan Chinoy, the Director General of India's Manoha Parekar Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis and former ambassador, and the Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council of the United States, Jenna Ben Yehuda. Welcome to our panel. So let's just dive straight in. The world is, world warfare is incredibly complex. And what we see now is very much the blurring of the lines between state and non-state actors and the growing role of emerging technologies in modern combat, highlighting the emergence of a new era of warfare. So to begin, I would really like to ask each and every one of you, and I'll start with you, Jenna, and go along, just to ask you to briefly describe your understanding of what informal warfare is, how you see it manifested in current conflicts, and what challenges, if any, does it pose to conventional defence strategies? Jenna. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, and it's a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing my co-panelists' responses to this. I think uh, the, we at the Atlantic Council have a perspective on this through our program, Adding Colour to the Grey Zone. Um, we really talk about kind of two elements here, and I'm glad we're setting the stage with definitions. So when we talk about the Grey Zone, we're really referring to the defensive and offensive activity that is above cooperation and below the threshold of armed conflict. That's a pretty broad space. And so then when we think about a hybrid uh, conflict or the hybrid nature of warfare, we're thinking about kind of three key elements in their interplay. The first would be a, a domain combination. And we talk in the US about dime. So diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, the last of which we've certainly seen a dramatic increase 
and its usage. Two, where it exists along the spectrum of the competition continuum. It could range from cooperation to competition, deterrence, and all the way up to armed conflict. And the third would be the purpose, the purpose of it impacting the national security objectives against a state or non-state actor. This comes into play in a number of places. You mentioned the Houthis. This is a really dramatic example of a leveling of the playing field, if you will, a relatively unsophisticated armed group having a tremendous impact on world commerce. In its first month, dramatic declines by a third. That combined with the, with the drought we saw in the Panama Canal and Gatun Lake positive, creating really massive disruption in shipping. This was intended to be a response to pressure Israel and its war in Gaza in response to the Hamas attacks, but one of the, the countries most impacted in that has been Egypt, who derives a quarter of its currency earnings from those very passage tallies. So what we see here is a, a, a shrapnel effect almost of sometimes these intended effects might be wide ranging, which can make them hard to plan for and proportionality hard to respond to. Thanks, Jim. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Um, for me, the main features of uh, informal warfare or new wars today are that we are uh, contending with uh, a multiplicity uh, of uh, definitions here, hybrid warfare, asymmetrical warfare, unconventional warfare, low intensity warfare, and above all, prolonged conflicts, the type that uh, do not seem to have uh, any kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, end to them. And uh, nobody really wants uh, ceasefires. So we are looking at uh, uh, this kind of a scenario in which uh, increasingly uh, things like trade, technology, and even tenets as in narratives, that is to say, systems of uh, governance, whether social, political, cultural, or economic, are increasingly being weaponized. So we are looking at uh, this complex scenario in which uh, I also see a fusion of uh, state and non-state actors. Uh, and uh, in the case of state actors, I see an increasing tendency to use uh, uh, conventional and uh, non-conventional means. Uh, so it's a very, very complex situation, and all recent wars have, uh, to some extent, exhibited these uh, qualities, uh, including the extensive use of uh, cheap, asymmetrical means to bridge absolute gaps in military power, as we saw in the case of Hamas's rockets, for example, or the drones that have been used so far. Uh, so we can expect uh, this situation to continue with uh, uh, also uh, an increasing blend of other aspects that are uh, around us, that is the use of uh, uh, cyber power uh, and uh, uh, increasing use of artificial intelligence. And I feel that in artificial intelligence, you are now looking at a super uh, spreader of misinformation, which will also impinge on military decisions. Facial recognition will mean that uh, commanders on the battlefield will be identified individually perhaps taken out individually in order to impact on the morale of troops. And I think uh, that is something that we must uh, keep in mind. But there are some silver linings to this, like uh, natural language uh, processing capabilities of AI. For me, I see a possibility to create soldier support systems, uh, translation systems, which can also help confidence building measures, for example, in face-to-face -face situations or uh, situations involving prolonged face-offs. Uh, but I can uh, elaborate on this uh, as we go down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and it's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel. I'm, I'm just going to make a few observations. So we're uh, really inspired by a, a great speech that General Chow Han gave uh, at dinner yesterday. And, and that is to say, I, I want to talk first about the nature of informal warfare, and, and Jenna did a great job, I think, with setting the, the, the definitional picture here, and then make some comments a bit about the, the character of informal warfare. 
My, my observation about uh, the nature of informal warfare or grey zone conflict is that this phenomenon is really as old as warfare itself. There's, there's, there's nothing really new about the fundamental nature of this. Uh, just one example from an Australian perspective is our involvement in the, in the Confrontasi episode in the mid-1960s, but that was really very typical of, uh, of the... Um, of the below the threshold struggle that went on right through the Cold War period. And that's just a recent, relatively recent historical example. Fundamentally, this is about the pursuit of political objectives and in some cases, geoeconomic objectives. That includes pursuit obviously of territorial claims, uh, but it can also include efforts to increase your military advantage or to weaken uh, weaken opponents. All of these are classic uh, tenets, of course, of military strategy. I think it's worth making the observation that informal warfare or grey zone uh, tactics are often a feature of periods of heightened tension, and that's, uh, that's the case right through history. And, of course, we are now, uh, unfortunately, living through uh, another period of elevated global tension. And uh, because I'm an intelligence officer, it's my job to draw, draw attention to, to the downside risks. Uh, it often precedes uh, uh, open hostilities. That's just a historical reality that I think we have to be mindful of and perhaps we'll get a chance just to talk about the role of intelligence in that context because, of course, warning becomes a critical uh, responsibility for my community in those circumstances that conflict could break through the threshold. Um, even though the nature of informal warfare is not changing, I would suggest, um, uh, as the ambassador was just saying, that, that the, the character of informal warfare is changing and changing very rapidly, and that means we have to stay up with the pace. Um, the range of actors involved is, is uh, multiplying significantly and I think um, it's worth paying attention to the fact that obviously it involves sort of covert forces of different types, proxies of different types, militias, uh, but also increasingly private companies. This is not new. There was a thing called the um, East India Company. It's worth uh, flagging here. But... Um, but we are seeing with Wagner and, and, and uh, similar, um, similar companies, I think, a greater role for a range of non-state actors uh, in, in the field of uh, informal conflict and even individuals. And on that note, that really brings me just briefly to technology and the role of technology in, if you like, democratising or distributing capabilities that were not previously available to small non-state groups or or uh, other non-state actors, including companies, or indeed to individuals. And technology is driving a massive increase in the speed and scale, the reach, uh, the, the impact, and in some cases, the lethality of capabilities that are relevant to informal uh, warfare. Disinformation, we're all obviously very focused on the potential for artificial intelligence to massively increase the quantity of disinformation, but um, perhaps even more importantly, the quality of disinformation. So we're watching that very closely. Cyber and its impact through social media uh, interference and, and um, we've talked about the other capabilities. I think these, um, these emerging tools of informal warfare become even more important and can have a street a strategic impact when they're well integrated with the other more traditional instruments of national uh, statecraft and power, whether that's traditional diplomacy or military power uh, or um, uh, economic coercion or foreign interference, which are both issues that have been a, a, a preoccupation uh, for Australia and I know from talking to counterparts for, for many others. And also lawfare, which is a, a feature of both uh, the Russian and Chinese uh, playbooks in this area. And then finally, um, the ability of, of these tools of informal warfare to target what I like to think of as, as traditional Western binaries. You know, the Western mind uh, 
uh, is habituated to the idea that we are either at peace or we're at war. And we believe very deeply as part of our DNA that you're either a combatant or a non-combatant. Well, our adversaries in the grey zone uh, do not have that view. They believe in perpetual struggle, which is sometimes non-kinetic, but often, uh, often kinetic as well. And they deliberately exploit those gaps. So um, just a few final thoughts. We need to be focused on our preparedness. That's everything from expanding our military industrial production. This is, was a huge issue in Munich when I was at the Munich Security Conference last week. We're all aware of it. There's a massive amount of capability across the West and beyond, but somehow we're in a situation where the sum is less than the parts and we need to remedy that as a matter of urgency. And then we need the technological capabilities and we need the partnerships uh, to take on these challenges. And there's been a lot of talk about supply chains here, about protecting our supply chains. I'm looking hard, as the ambassador was saying, at uh, North Korea's supply chains uh, into Russia and elsewhere and also Iran's. And I think we have to get over those much more aggressively because those, uh, that, that league of authoritarian powers uh, and, and the military and dual-use supply chains are starting to have strategic effect. Thank you, Andrew. General. Uh, thank you, Lisa. What I'll do is I'll first talk about uh, the impact of uh, informal wars on conventional defense, and then maybe I'll talk about uh, how do we prepare for it. Uh, when I was a middle-level officer uh, in one of a school of tactics, you know, reading about defense, uh, it was a normal saying that if uh, enemy has uh, only four options available to him, he's actually going to choose the fifth option. Uh, in uh, informal wars, the enemy has more options than the fifth option. He has the sixth, seventh, eighth, multiple options he has. You know, when we talk about uh, conventional defense, defense per se has uh, some kind of a uh, finite thing attached to it. It's finite in time, space, etc. Offense is not so finite. So defense is always finite. Whereas when you enter the territory of informal warfare, the options available to the adversary are much more. The targets are legitimate, which actually in formal wars were only very few. The area is very vast. He could go on to any kind of a domain. So he has a particular kind of an advantage uh, over there. The second uh, important thing which we learned over there that, you know, defense by itself will not do. A defense has to be slightly proactive. We also talk, talked about mobile kind of a defense. So you have to be always shifting. Uh, when we talk about defense proper, I think uh, uh, over here, uh, the two ways to defend it and this how it will happen means how it affects actually conventional operations. One is deterrence. So you have to have a strong deterrence actually so that uh, that deterrence is able to you know, uh, dissuade uh, those actors who are uh, right to carry out this kind of informal uh, actions. So that I think is important. And slightly, I think probably uh, we'll have to be slightly proactive while dealing with informal warfare. So that would require a good kind of an intelligence setup uh, and a faster kind of a reaction. As far as uh, non-traditional threats are concerned, so or say, how do we adjust towards this formal arrangements of informal threats? You know, uh, these threats actually cut across uh, multiple domains and uh, they affect not only the military, uh, they affect uh, the intelligence agencies, they affect the uh, people who are involved in the national security architecture. So uh, you require to have uh, within the government multi-agency coordination between all actually to perceive these kind of uh, threats. Uh, then, of course, uh, these kind of informal, informal uh, uh, wars, they also cut across uh, national boundaries. So then again, there is a requirement to coordinate between your uh, friends and partners to understand what kind of uh, threats are likely to emerge. And then uh, finally, they also cut across uh, multiple disciplines. So it is not only related to, say, uh, what happens in the field of military, but it could be, say, bio threats or, say, pandemics. Uh, such kind of non-traditional threats. And we all know what happened uh, during the COVID pandemic. 
uh, at least as a country, uh, with such a huge population base, we are just caught unprepared for this. And then we had to uh, get uh, various organs of the government work together, work with foreign agencies, get things going over here. The vaccines were made somewhere else. Uh, that, and then, of course, the manufacturing was done, mass manufacturing was done over here, and a whole lot of things. Uh, so this, uh, fighting this kind of a war, actually, requires you to be very, very innovative. You'll have to be very, very adaptive and very, very inventive in your approach if you were to succeed in uh, this kind of warfare. And that's what I would say to be done. Thank, thank you, General. Minister. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank my co-panelists for setting the scene as well as they've done, because I would say what is hybrid warfare, what is informal warfare, well, it's all of the above, everything that's been said, and that makes it so complex. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it's true, it's not new. Uh, it, it's it's the, the blur between peace and war, between truth and lies, and it's always been part uh, of warfare. But it is gaining traction in the world that we live in now. It's becoming more uh, important, and it's very complicated because it's used by non-state actors and by state actors. And it targets uh, states, but it also targets uh, civilians within our states. So it's not military to military. Uh, uh, and, and that makes it complicated. I think we all know that we have to deal with it every day. We are suffering cyber attacks as countries, as companies. Uh, we are um, noticing in our part of the world that our seabed infrastructure is being mapped. Um, and I don't think it's out of interest for, for the seabed. It's out of interest for our critical infrastructure. Uh, we know that uh, espionage is happening uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we are aware of, for instance, uh, migrants being used in hybrid warfare at our borders uh, in, in Europe. So it, uh, this, is, this, is, this is happening to us. Uh, and it's very complicated for governments to deal with it, uh, especially uh, as it is done in, in ways that we don't, we don't have the instruments. So if you look at, for instance, economic coercion, uh, where economic powerhouses gain uh, access to critical assets such as energy infrastructures, uh, for instance, uh, then you have to start in a very, very early stage uh, because uh, once it's done, it's often too late uh, to deal with it again. Uh, and having access to that critical infrastructure, uh, ports, uh, for instance, energy infrastructure, uh, means uh, that uh, you have not you the full control over your own infrastructure. And full control of your infrastructure is vital, of course, once you are fighting in, in a war. So these are really new challenges that we have to add to our conventional uh, defense strategies and that we have to face. Uh, and as a Minister of Defense, I know that we, as the Ministry of Defense, as our armed forces, cannot deal with this alone. So this requires a whole of society approach. We need society in there. We need our companies uh, to engage, uh, to, to uh, our port authorities, our energy infrastructure companies, our cyber experts uh, to cooperate uh, with us and also to recognize uh, the threats. Um, and we, we in the Netherlands and in Europe, we often experience that people don't feel the, the threat that is actually there. And that is why we are now uh, exposing more of it. Uh, our uh, secret services usually don't want to talk about what they do, but now we have to, because we have to make uh, people aware of the fact that they are also subject to this type uh, of influencing. Uh, and that brings me to the last subject that I would like to raise, and that is the use of misinformation. Uh, we know that uh, Russia has been meddling in elections uh, in various countries. Uh, it, it's all out in the open. Uh, we also know that there are state actors who are involved in, in trying to divide groups within countries uh, to uh, polarize societies using misinformation, using social media, and I very strongly believe that transparency is the best answer to it, uh, but also um, making people aware in our societies of the fact that social media can mislead, uh, that AI can be a very powerful weapon uh, for uh, our enemies to use uh, in uh, trying to influence the opinions of public and even influence thereby the outcome 
of elections, something that I think is important uh, to notice in the largest democracy in the world. So it has various forms uh, and we need various answers and instruments to tackle hybrid warfare. Thank you, Minister. And I think uh, all our panellists have given such uh, a deep dive, as I asked for, into our, your understanding and the, uh, the context of informal warfare. I, it has meant that we only have about 20 minutes left to, for me to ask each and every one of you a question uh, specifically. I wanted to start, though, actually, I might start with you, Minister, in, in following on from, from your contribution to talk about the use of drones. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's very much at the moment something where the use of drones uh, are foreshadowing a world in which armed conflicts are conducted by pretty much remote control. And in the context of Ukraine and Russia, um, the hypermodern battleground where drones play a crucial role in surveillance and reconnaissance and combat missions, it really d does demonstrate that huge shift away from manned weaponry. So, Minister, I wanted to ask you what role you do see the use, how you see the use of drones uh, playing out, um, also uncrewed uh, aerial vehicles in current conflicts like Russia and Ukraine, but also future conflicts. Yes, thank you very much. Well, what we're seeing now in Ukraine, I think it shows that uh, there is conventional uh, warfare combined with new technologies, uh, and that is uh, uh, very dominant in, in this war. And, and I think the Ukraine's successes uh, are uh, thanks to their uh, ability to really incorporate those new technology while they are fighting this war. Uh, and it's quite impressive. I think it also shows that we, it's unthinkable not to use drones in, in warfare. And when I say drones, I mean uh, new technology used in drones, all kinds of unmanned systems uh, on every layer uh, in your air defense and also, as we've seen in the Black Sea, uh, in and on, on the sea. Uh, and also the response to it, of course, which means that electronic warfare has become much more important. And if, so if you have the, um, uh, the ability to adapt your technology all the time and actually use it in warfare, then you're going to be the stronger, the stronger, uh, uh, fight, the stronger in the fight. So uh, drones, apps, space satellites, uh, it is indispensable in, in modern uh, warfare. And that means that for, for us, um, monitoring and detection is going to be very important, so we have to invest strongly in that. And that means that we are also going to invest strongly in our co cooperation and coordination uh, with uh, partner uh, countries, uh, exchange of, of experience in all kinds of international fora, uh, and having uh, that edge um, uh, in India, for instance, you have, uh, of course, very highly educated uh, um, uh, expertise and, uh, and, and people that you, can, um, that you can use to advance that technology. And for us, it's vital that we cooperate uh, with other countries because um, I think there we have... Uh, the, it's it's what, the, what we need in the future. And I think it's, it's not drones. It's, it's more than drones. It's AI. Uh, it is using AI, uh, where we, we see already, of course, the, the usage of, um, of, of, of drones in, in, in swarms. Um, and how the, what the question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, how can we use it? How can we use AI, drones, and new technologies in a way that also protects our military, uh, that protect our armed forces, that make, uh, make us stronger and also safer? And at the same time, I feel very strongly that we should use AI and new technologies also to make uh, war as fair as possible. And that may sound strange, but I think one of the purposes uh, that we have, that our armed forces have, is also to avoid uh, civil casualties. Uh, we're seeing much too many of them now in Gaza, we're seeing much too many of them in, in Ukraine, uh, and using new techniques will also make it possible to be much more targeted uh, in your warfare. So uh, technologies can have great advantages if used in the right ways. And we also have to be aware of the fact that our adversaries are so often not uh, very bothered uh, by uh, these, these issues. Uh, so to engage and have that type of conversation is also impossible. But it's, it's changing warfare completely. Well, of course, drones have also come into play when we look at the return, you know, in a sense, in the return of proxy wars, and Ambassador 
I wanted to ask you, we've seen with Iran supplying drones to the Houthi uh, as an example of that. Russia similarly has be, you know, been known to use proxies to further their aims and expand influence. So, Ambassador, which, you know, what are the consequences with these sorts of tactics, using these sorts of tactics? What are the consequences on global security more broadly? And are we seeing a return of the proxy wars? So, let me begin by saying that uh, drones, in fact, have become a very potent uh, uh, object in the hands of belligerents. And we have seen the use of drones in all the recent conflicts, beginning with the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, uh, but more recently, the use of the Samad-1 drone uh, produced by Iran. We have seen that in the hands uh, of uh, the Russians as well. Uh, and uh, these have been known to take out, uh, for example, tanks, as we have seen uh, when Ukraine used drones against uh, Russian tanks, uh, in the case of Hamas, uh, they used uh, drones, cheap drones, to drop uh, ordnance on what you call uh, uh, ISR uh, uh, capabilities and watchtowers uh, along the Israel-Gaza border. And uh, this therefore takes you into a totally new realm when combined with uh, uh, armed UAVs. For example, the Houthis uh, possess uh, the uh, Asif uh, uh, and Tufan missiles, uh, which have a long range. They have drones, which have a long range. Uh, and so where does that leave uh, things like uh, arms control treaties? Uh, the MTCR, for example, in my view, uh, is completely uh, dead as a dodo right now, uh, because uh, these technologies have become fungible. Uh, they are being proliferated. And uh, it also leads to uh, the question as to what is happening with uh, the NPT in general. Uh, or the uh, other uh, treaties like uh, the New START Treaty, uh, the INF and the ABM are gone. Uh, so what does that mean for the future of warfare? Um, and I think it's particularly relevant to keep in mind that non-state actors, when they possess territory, they become even more potent. We have seen the case of uh, the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, when they acquire territory and have influence over the local people, they are much harder to get uh, you know, rid of or to deal with. Uh, the Houthis have done the same thing in Yemen. We've seen Hamas do that in Gaza. Uh, and uh, there are other examples of the ISIS uh, in both Iraq and Syria, and more relevantly, the recent example of the Taliban in Afghanistan. So remember that a non-state actor in possession of territory is much harder to get rid of. And such a belligerent will always use uh, cheaper means like drones, uh, homemade garage uh, made uh, rockets uh, to overwhelm uh, the uh, adversary. But may I also say very briefly here that this is an era uh, of informal warfare in which uh, uh, private players, the private internet, uh, private individuals like Elon Musk, for example, with his Starlink, uh, are beginning to have a say in the conduct of uh, warfare and also in outcomes. So we are looking at that. On the other hand, there is the advent of NGOs, civil society, uh, the youth, uh, and uh, transnational constituencies that do not agree with their own governments in regard to their views regarding uh, a certain adversary. And they are beginning to have a say in uh, the conduct of informal warfare and outcomes uh, as well. Uh, so I think uh, these are important to keep in mind. Look, let, I want to move and look at the issue of critical infrastructure. Um, you know, we're increasingly seeing a trend in acts of sabotage, including gas pipelines and undersea cables for telecommunications, all of which cross national borders, all of which often run through international waters. If we focus on Huawei, for example, a company that is state-owned and known to share intelligence with the Chinese government. Andrew, I wanted to ask you, what... What is the role of intelligence in responding to these sorts of non-traditional threats? Well, thanks, Lisa. I, I'm, um, I guess my starting point is that in a, a period like this where there's much more of this sort of grey zone activity, um, intelligence, I think, uh, takes on more responsibility and in some ways has become more prominent, which is not always something we, we welcome, I have to say. Um, when I think about 
what this means for us, um, I start with a very traditional role for intelligence, which is strategic warning. Uh, and that um, that's very real for us in Australia, where for several decades we uh, worked in our defence policy on the assumption we had a 10-year strategic warning window of a major conflict. Uh, and after a major review last year, uh, the Australian government has accepted the premise that that's no longer true. That's profoundly significant for our defence policy and I feel the additional responsibility of providing warning that this grey zone activity could break through into open conflict. Uh, it, it's a very profound responsibility for me and my colleagues and that applies in the cyber domain and, and, and other um, aspects uh, as well. Uh, the second is also a classic responsibility of intelligence, and that is to provide situational awareness uh, for our decision makers and decision making advantage. And that's, um, that's in the traditional sense of giving as much context about conflict as possible or impending conflict, but also uh, in, for example, critical infrastructure. It, it's a wider responsibility now to help government make very difficult cost-benefit decisions about foreign investment in our major critical infrastructure uh, and about critical technologies. Uh, that, that is also an area where our responsibilities have increased. And of course, providing support for our warfighters will remain central. And then the, the, just the third thing I'd flag is the role of intelligence as itself a tool of statecraft and in this grey zone domain, um, we bring, for example, uh, intelligence diplomacy as a tool for government, working in close alignment with policy, building out our intelligence partnership, sharing our assessments. That's really important because when governments share a common picture about the threat, they're more likely to take uh, coordinated and aligned action in response and building up the capability of our partner services in Australia's case, especially in Southeast Asia and the Pacific means increased aggregate capacity uh, and it also means that we are lifting the levels of security um, with all our partners and reducing the overall threat surface. Uh, and then finally, I'll leave it on this enigmatic note. Um, for Western and other intelligence services, there's always been a strong historical association between intelligence and, um, and uh, covert uh, action and intelligence services continue to provide a range of tools to government and I think it's really important that we have the capabilities to confront our adversaries wherever they choose to challenge us, including in the grey zone. So on the grey zone, my last question is on that specifically to both Jenna and to the General. I wanted to, firstly, just to the General, you've played a significant role in India's national security uh, transformation. How do you see grey zone warfare particularly influencing, or, you know, or, you know, how do you see it counteracting these sorts of hybrid threats? And then I'll throw to you, Jenna. So, Lisa, let me begin by saying that uh, in this lexicon on warfare, we have this gray zone as this uh, latest entry. And this is because what's happened in South China Sea and what's happened along our northern borders. Uh, in my view, uh, gray zone warfare is some kind of a military action below a particular threshold which will invite a response. And uh, Andrew tried to actually differentiate the difference between how West thinks warfare is and how East thinks warfare is. And it spoke about uh, that West thinks about two possibilities of peace and war. And there's something which is no war, no peace in between. And the difference between kinetic and non-kinetic and combatants and non-combatants. Uh, let me add a couple of more things to this particular debate. Uh, I think uh, in the Western construct, we believe in uh, direct military action. Whereas in the Chinese construct or the Eastern construct, it would be timely military action. That I think would be important. Uh, the end state in any Western construct would be a decisive military kind of an, uh, a victory. Whereas uh, probably in an oriental kind of a construct, it would be decisive military positioning actually. 
rather than a victory. So that is, I think, is important. Then, uh, whenever we talk about uh, gray zone, probably the dividends of what military action you take today, a dividends may be uh, available to you after many, many years, actually. It may not be at that particular moment. I think that, again, is uh, important. And uh, to start this, possibly, possibly, you will have to have some kind of a historical uh, or a dispute to this particular issue to be successful in uh, launching this kind of an warfare. So, uh, so to tackle gray zone warfare, you require multiple kind of approaches because uh, the origin may lie in a historical dispute. So you have to be very correct. So it will uh, uh, I mean, so range from history, it will range from legal warfare, it will range for preparation for all kinds of uh, conditions which I just uh, spoke about. Thank you, General. Jenna, what are some of the challenges on the US side for hybrid threats and in this gray zone war? So we have a few more hours to, to address <laughs> some of the complexity here. Uh, we've talked a lot about the nature of the problem. I think we all agree it's huge and it's really complicated and it means we need to talk to more people and different people more often. So how do you do that? Because I think what we're all saying is that our systems of government, our militaries, are not necessarily designed for this kind of dynamic. So what you perceive here is this friction between the world we live in and the world that we've built systems designed to confront. And that misalignment is, is that sticky place where we are. So what do you do about it? The, the late, great US Defense Secretary, Ash Carter, was once asked, what is the greatest threat to US national security? And he said, defense acquisition. And he was only half kidding. And there are many people here who, who have the privilege of working for him. And you know what I mean, because it takes way too long to field the kinds of systems and weaponry that we need to be able to be responsive to the moment in which we live. Andrew's comment about that warning time frame shifting from 10 years to, in some cases, potentially weeks, if you're lucky, has dramatic consequences. So what do you do about it? I think Ukraine offers a really compelling example because it's not just what kinds of technology you have, although table stakes, it's important. And we see what the impact of a lack of ammunition has meant for Ukraine. But if that is a base layer, the differentiator is really in the ability for governments to deploy that technology and to do it at scale and with agility and with speed. So thinking about interoperability, responsiveness, that's also hugely important. One of the other risks of this type of conflict is also of unintended escalation. When you don't know of something, you know it's not peace, you know it's not war, it's somewhere in the middle, how do you respond to it? Our doctrine doesn't necessarily provide a script for that. The doctrine needs to get better and needs to adapt to this world, but it also means that we need more avenues of cooperation and dialogue. And that is a case for diplomacy. Really being able to connect with counterparts, to pick up the phone, to have harder conversations and trusted conversations. Within our own societies, it means we have to work to increase levels of trust in government, in military, in our own information, Countries that fared the worst in COVID were not necessarily those who had poor health systems. They were those countries with the lowest levels of trust. And so thinking about agility, interoperability, the ability to scale, rethinking acquisition, really getting to it, addressing those low levels of trust and increasing the ability to bring down that escalatory ladder quickly that is a way to be responsive to this current moment. It's not going to be easy. Well, look, our, our panellists have given us so much food for thought to now open it up to the floor, and I'm pleased that we have a little bit of time to be able to do that. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, and I'm actually going to ask you to state your name, but also I will start with the Rizina Young Fellows and then see how we go for time with anyone else. So, yes. Thank you, Chair. Samuel Bashfield from the Australia India Institute and also part of this very esteemed Racina Young Fellows Program. 
So I want to pick up on one theme that's been brought up in this conversation, which is critical infrastructure uh, that transits the seabed. Now, of course, this is not only submarine data cables, but also gas pipelines, electricity cables, and infrastructure associated with offshore renewable energy connections. And these are the so-called seabed lines of communication. So my question is, I'd really value any reflections on how the seabed protection interacts in this new era of new wars. Thank you. Okay, our panel is Seabed Protection Minister. Yes, thank you. I, I'd love to answer that question because it's a very important question and we're dealing with it every day. As I said, we are seeing it happening in, the, in our North Sea. We see Russian vessels uh, passing through. They can because it's international water, no problem. Um, uh, and we know it's exactly this that is very vulnerable to sabotage. So how can you respond to this? Well, first of all, awareness uh, and protection. Uh, and that is something that we're, we're often looked at as the Ministry of Defense and our Navy, but they cannot possibly do that alone. So we need the private companies, the owners uh, of the cables and the pi pipelines and everything in there. And uh, we're making great progress with them. And uh, we have very great examples in Europe of countries who have been able to, to map everything and to make sure that they have real time awareness of what is happening uh, there on, on the seabed. So that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing, uh, is that we expose the activities. So uh, if we know that this mapping is being done or any other suspicious activity is going on, we simply expose it. We make sure that the, the, uh, the actor engaged knows that we are aware and we expose it to our public. Uh, and the last line of defense is also to make sure that we will respond. We will respond. So we engage with our partners. Uh, it's, of course, always a specific region that you're looking at. So in our case, the North Sea partners. We have joined in the, in the JEF, Joint Expeditionary Force, all Northern European countries that put their capabilities in. And they, they will be there in no time if something happens. So to be very firm of this, both on the uh, engagement of the private companies, of the awareness uh, and the exposure, and our response is sending the signal that this, is, this was for us is not acceptable. Uh, I mean, you can do a lot of damage and you can do a lot of harm both ways, always. It's not only two sides. Uh, but we are uh, we are really uh, uh, we are really cautious, of course, uh, of, of what is happening, but firm in our response. Thank you, and Ambassador. Could I just say that uh, an informal warfare has already begun with regard to deep seabed mining and and undersea resources, thermal vents, uh, polymetallic nodules, etc. And we can see that in the Pacific, in the Northern Pacific, and the Clarion Clipperton zone. Uh, there are a number of players there, including the Chinese uh, with Comra. In the Indian Ocean, we see that this scrimmage is now shifting towards uh, the acreage given by the International Seabed Authority of the Rodrigues Ridge in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and the important thing here is that a country like the United States of America is not even a member of the International Seabed Alliance, uh, the Inter International Seabed Authority. And so therefore, uh, it gives an opportunity to certain countries, uh, you know who I'm referring to, uh, to actually influence the International Seabed Authority, its uh, workshops, its funding, its meetings. And uh, you now have countries like Nauru, which has just, uh, just switched alliance, um, uh, allegiance from uh, Taiwan to the People's Republic, clamoring for completing the uh, regulatory norms within uh, a short time. Uh, and who will then contribute to this uh, rule making is the question. So I think um, many more countries need to uh, take interest in the uh, making of norms for seabed resources and notably the United States of America. Thank you. We might have time for one more question. Yes. My question is to General Anil Chauhan, sir. Uh, so given that China is weaponizing the dependencies, like following a whole of society approach, how do we as a society and citizens prepare ourselves to counter this offensive? And uh, while we are preparing, how do we strike a fine balance to ensure that our security needs are also met? At the same time, we don't create a security dilemma and fragmentation of global value chains. Uh, 
you know, you have uh, brought in a different dimension of the Chinese threat, actually. And uh, in the military, we've traditionally considered with the traditional kind of a threats uh, the, with the Chinese. So not only what's happening onto the northern borders, but uh, also long-term challenges so that we don't have a technological kind of a deficit. But uh, you have brought in a concept where you're trying to get the whole of nation approach towards uh, preparing yourself against this kind of a Chinese uh, OPA uh, surging kind of a capacity which they can build to us. This will require a different kind of a thought process. It will require involvement of all organs and all instruments of the government to think this uh, particular threat through and create capacities, not only in the field of military, in information domain, in your perception management domain, in economic domain, technological domain, in every domain of whatever we need. Thank you, General. And on that note, I am going to ask you to join me in thanking our panel. It's been a very informative discussion. And thank you to ORF and MEA for hosting us for this important uh, panel discussion. Thank you.